Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Daggett County in Utah, I heard something out in the mountain that I had never heard before and have not heard since in the wild. In early October, I met a couple of hunting buddies at a predetermined location where we would set up camp for the rifle elk hunt. My friends had arrived several days prior to the start of the hunt and scouted the area on horseback. I arrived two days before the hunt was to start to also scout the area. The area that we were going to hunt was on the north slope of the Unida Mountains. We chose a secluded high mountain meadow with thick, dark pines on one side and mixed aspen and pines on the other. We had set up camp at the top of the park next to a rising hillside of aspen with a stream close by to water the horses. We lashed down aspen trees to the living trees to make a corral for the horses so that they would not have to be hobbled or tied. The jeep trail to our camp was very long and rough. Down timber had not been cleared for years. The truck and horse trailer had to be bounced over numerous deadfalls in order to reach our camp. Arriving at camp early in the evening, two days prior to the start of the hunt, I started cooking dinner with my two hunting friends. The sun had already set, and it was between 8.30 and 9.30 in the evening. We were cooking steaks on a camp stove. There was some noise from the hiss of the stove of the cooking food. The campfire was situated between the table where we were cooking and the tree line where the horses were standing and watching us prepare the meal. The area around the horses, trucks, and tent was lightly illuminated from the light of the fire and lantern. One of my friends had gone to his truck or the tent to retrieve something, while my other friend and I continued cooking. We were talking about the area that we were going to scout the following day when we heard a very loud and deep resonating roar which lasted for three to four seconds. We both stopped talking and looked at the horses to see their reaction. It didn't faze them. I had a reaction. The hair stood up on the back of my neck and on my arm. I asked my friend if he had heard that and he responded that he had and asked what it was. I answered that I didn't know. Without another word between us, we both went to our respective vehicles and loaded our rifles. The other friend did not hear the roar. The sound emanated on our side of the crest of the hill, west-northwest of our camp position at a distance of approximately 300 yards. I do not know what it was, however. I do not know what it was not. None of the known animals native in the area make a deep, resonating roar like what I heard. Furthermore, only a very large animal could have made such a deep, sustained resonating sound that could carry for that distance. Bull elk are very vocal at night. However, the rut had passed and no whistle, chuckle, or grunting was present. Elk will scream when mad, but it is a higher pitch than what we heard and shorter. Moose and deer don't make loud volumetric calls. Bears, coyotes, foxes, and cougars are higher pitch and do not resonate. A really big bear might be able to make such a deep sound for that duration, however, no bawling or drop of tone was present in the roar. I have investigated numerous sounds to see what comes close to what I heard. A year ago, I found a recording of a roar from a large gorilla on the internet, and this is the sound I heard in the mountains that night. Unfortunately, I didn't save the website. The sounds recorded on Bigfoot website as described as howls or screams are very similar. However, what I heard was missing the higher pitches or howling noises. Perhaps they were present, 
but drowned out by the camp stove and lantern. I thought that it was odd that the horses didn't get spooked at the roar, but I didn't note the direction of the wind when this happened. Usually, scent has to accompany a sight or a sound for the horses to spook. Later that night, the horses broke out of the corral that we had made. I'm not sure if they were spooked or were just bored and chewed through the twine lashings that were holding the poles to the trees. There was plenty of game that week. Deer, elk, and moose. We didn't think to investigate the hillside above camp the following morning for any tracks or sign of what made the noise. We were focused on elk, and the area was not on the agenda. One of my friends heard it, but the other did not. He was in the tent or truck. It was clear skies, no wind. The temperature was 50 during the day and mid-20s at night. A large, low-pressure system blew in two days later and dumped two and a half feet of snow. At the time of the incident, there was no snow on the ground. There are thick pine forests and mixed pine and quaking aspen. The area is wheatgrass meadow, swampy, shallow ponds, larger lakes, and streams teeming with trout. When I returned to work the following week, I mentioned the strange sound to several people to see if anyone had ever experienced anything similar. One person said that when he was younger and on a week-long horseback trip in the primitive area of the Unidas, something started making loud noises late one night after they had gone to bed like the noise that I had described. He called it a wild banshee and said that they didn't get a wink of sleep that night. He said that it was circling the camp, screaming, roaring, shaking trees, throwing rocks and broken limbs. He remembers that he and his brothers sat huddled in the tent while his dad stayed focused on the direction of the circling noises with the pistol at the ready. He said the horses were tied and hobbled and they were going crazy. He said that the noises stopped a little while before sunrise. At first light, they packed up and got out of there. I vaguely recall he mentioned that this happened up in the Red Castle area. On to the next one. In Emory County in Utah, while elk hunting in Fairview, Utah, my friend and I both heard a very penetrating scream that lasted about 10 seconds and repeated itself for a duration of about two minutes. We were in James Canyon, which is a very long horse ride from the road, and we were sitting underneath some trees waiting for sunup. We had scouted this place all summer and knew a large population of elk were in the area. We never saw another person in any previous trip and saw none on this particular day. The scream was extremely voluminous and shook the whole forest. It had the sound of a mixture of a baby crying, a mountain lion roaring, and the snort of a bull. I've spent my whole life in the woods of North America, pursuing game animals, and have heard every possible noise. I've also practiced veterinary medicine for 20 years and teach biology. In short, I've heard it all until this. My friend and I never did figure out what it was until a student played the Ohio scream of Bigfoot for me and all the memories came flooding in. I had my hunting buddy listen to it also and it took his breath away. We had big guns at the time of the incident, so we did not fear anything. But now we wish we had pursued the thing making the noise. We are not cooks, and I will swear on a stack of outdoor life that this is true. It has me convinced we were dang close to a very furry friend. On to the next one. In the Unita Basin in Utah, the witness suddenly woke up from a sound sleep and felt someone holding her hand very gently. She opened her eyes and saw a huge hairy humanoid sitting beside her on the bed holding her hand. The witness screamed, then the tall hairy creature ran down a hallway and into the family room and vanished. On to the next one. 
I was a member of a small club called the Hill Climbers. Our little group was somewhat loose-knit, with our members being a total of about 20 people, give or take. There were, however, seven of us who were hardcore, and unless thick, we were on every one of our planned hikes. We all knew each other, either from the workplace or as neighbors, and we had a mix of both men and women. It was on June 1st, 1989, that the event which I'm about to share with you and your listeners occurred. There were nine of our club that day that had planned to hike up to and around a monument which is no longer there. This location was known as the Old Man of the Mountain, named so because, depending on what angle you looked at it from, it appeared to be the side profile of a man's face. It was tremendous and jutted out from the face of a granite cliff atop a small mountain. I say that it is no longer there because it has since fallen from the face of the cliff, having given way to time and erosion. As a group, we were cutting a new trail through the forest, making our way up to the old man, when we found ourselves walking along a steep incline covered in a lot of loose granite stones. As we were walking, one of our group, Katie, lost her footing and went sliding down the slope a good 40 feet, coming to an abrupt stop. Of course, we were all asking, are you all right? And the usual things, after which we all began to make our way down to assist her. We always came equipped to the max and this day was no exception. We had tied a length of climber's rope to a tree and me and two others made our way down to Katie. The others stayed where they were in case we needed any further assistance from above. Now, for those of your listeners who are unfamiliar with the state, New Hampshire is known as the Granite State, and with good reason. Virtually everywhere that you look or dig, you will either see or find granite. Katie herself was lying on a pile of granite gravel. We made our way down to her while holding onto the rope, and thankfully, it appeared she had just acquired some minor scrapes and bruises. She was more shook up than anything else. As we crouched by her, giving her some moral support and water, my eyes were drawn to a piece of red fabric hanging out from behind a slab of granite to my right. I think that I should pause for a moment to describe for you what I was seeing, as well as the surrounding area. This mountain was made from granite. However, it was also covered in dense forest. Throughout the woods, there were areas of the mountain's granite that were either exposed or jutting out from the surrounding trees and bushes. There were also numerous areas where rock slides had come down from above, such as the slide that Katie had just lost her footing on. In fact, if you pause to consider that the old man had fallen off from its cliff face, this was an example of thousands of tons falling in a single shot. Essentially, if you were under it at the time, it would have meant certain doom. So, we were kneeling by Katie, and I was looking at an area of granite that was protruding from the forest. It had a large notch carved out of it. Leaning against this large notch in the granite was a long and thick slab of granite that was the shape of an arrowhead. It was about six feet tall and three feet wide, being narrow at the top and wider at the bottom. The piece of red cloth was hanging out from behind this granite arrowhead. Seeing that Katie was all right, I pointed out to the group what I had seen and moved in for a closer look. The notch in the rock face in that slab was covering was about three feet deep into the face. As I got right up close to it, I peered in through the darkened cavity and saw what appeared to be a body. I immediately asked one of the guys, John, to bring down a flashlight so I could better see what I was looking at. Upon hearing that I had seen a body, everyone was more than a bit interested. Even Katie was getting to her feet. John had come down with a flashlight and was by my side, shining it into the cavity. Much to our horror, 
we were viewing the torso of a human being that was missing its head and its legs. The torso was wearing a red long sleeve flannel shirt and a green Harley Davidson vest. The slab that was covering the body was not leaning against it, but rather seemed to have been placed over the notch to cover the body. To me, there was no way that this slab could have fallen from above and remained intact. Besides that, the slope that we were on had no overhead granite from which it could have fallen. There was no way to estimate the weight of the slab, but it had to have weighed a couple of thousand pounds, and it was perfectly placed as if it was the covering of a tomb. The entire group had now descended via the rope to have a look at this discovery, and we were all aghast at the sight that was before our eyes. A couple of the men had gathered some large limbs and commenced to pry the slab away from the notch, which fell down the slope and exposed the body. The torso was completely decomposed, and the remaining garments were torn and tattered. There was also no odor whatsoever emanating from this makeshift tomb. My mind and those of a number of others in the group were thinking that this body had been deliberately concealed in this location. There was no evidence of the legs and head anywhere to be seen, but who or what could have placed this heavy slab over the notch was the big question. We left the body where it was and left the woods to get the authorities. That afternoon, the entire group, not wanting to leave, led the police back into the scene. We came in with lights and dogs and everything else that you could imagine, as we were sure we would be in there as night fell. Photographs were taken and questions were asked, as you would well imagine, as to exactly what we had seen when we first came across the body. The sun was setting, so we began to make our way out of the woods, while the authorities remained at the scene. It was then that a loud howl was heard coming from the timber in a distance. It both sounded and lasted in its duration, like that of a noontime fire siren, being prolonged and loud. It reminded me personally of the werewolf's howl in the movie An American Werewolf in London. It had sent a chill down my spine. All of us looked at each other as we collectively said, what the heck was that? Weeks later, my friend John had breached the subject with me of his own thinking that a Bigfoot had done this dirty deed. He further believed it was the same Bigfoot that we had heard as we exited the forest. Frankly, I just didn't know what to say. On to the next one. My husband and I were searching through great granddad Charles' old diaries. He passed away back in 1946. And his diaries were so interesting that some of them were on display in the old Kirbyville house for a long time and then handed down to us. We saw these references to ape men and thought you might want to hear about them. Charlie was the sort of postmaster for a while and we were told that he knew more than most people about the Illinois Valley and many people would go to him for asking and reporting what was happening in the country. Not like a town gossip, but more like the central information recorder, I guess. Anyway, the old articles appeared in the Argus newspaper, which soon became the courier. Grandad seemed to have a deep interest in the ape men reports, and here are some he kept a sort of diary on the event. June 1911. J.C. Matheson of the Oriel Mine in Glacey said, Two of his men on the late shift reported a big ape-like beast pushing rocks down the slope as they came off shift. A big one hit Tom Rockwell's thermos and smashed it. The foreman told them to forget it and not to say anything. August 1914. Sailor Diggings, J. Hawker Williams, said he worked at Sailor's Diggins in Waldo and back in them days, they had a giant two-legged critter stealing food from the cook shack. Said it must have been nine feet high. Nobody ever shot it, but he said it got scared off. July 1915. 
reported sighting of an eight-foot-tall forest critter with light black hair but walked on two legs was seen near town. August 15, 1920, Phil Haldsworth reported seeing one of the giant ape critters up on the B-level of the Almeida Mine. This is the fourth miner to see one. It didn't do anything, but watched him go to work. No date, just a notation. The owners of the Goldbug Mine, C. Romig, and Annie Neal hired Tom Mathers to sit guard at the mine site for a shot at the ape man if he comes back. He's been going into the supply shed and stealing potatoes and whatever else can be eaten. If you have an encounter you would like to share, you can reach me by submitting it to the email in the description box down below. Also, if you'd like to send in a physical letter of your encounter or any fan mail, I also have a P.O. box, which you can find in the description box down below. I love just hearing from all of you, so those options are available if you ever feel like reaching me. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!